Good morning, church family and friends. It's always good to meet, even like this, separated by space but not in time. At times like this, we see we see worldly systems being shaken, worldly kingdoms being shaken, even things in our lives that we were so sure of that we could depend on being less secure. And so, at this time, we, we draw near to God, our solid rock, our strength, our security. Hebrews 25 speaks about times like this and urges us that the right response, the good response, is to worship God, is to draw near to Him. I'll read it. Hebrews 12, verse 28. Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, Let us be thankful and please God by worshipping Him with holy fear and awe. So as we draw near in worship, let's offer up to Him again our hearts, our lives, our minds, our fears and insecurities. And let's embrace His kingdom rule. So let's pray. Father God, you alone are worthy of our fear and awe, our admiration and our praise. Forgive us for our idols of fear, the false trust we put in our own strength and wisdom. Forgive us for trying to find our security and our satisfaction in anything but you. Jesus. We thank you and praise you for the eternal security you have brought us. And Holy Spirit, we ask you now to help us worship from our hearts as we sing these songs of praise to you. Yes, sir. 
church I just sensed this morning as I was driving to the office that we serve an awesome God we serve a God that loves us we serve a God that pours out mercy grace we serve a God that is above every God and at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow every tongue confess that he is God friends this morning I sensed as I was driving to work there's someone out there that is listening to this that needs a breakthrough in their life you've been praying for years you've been seeking God you've been trusting him and and at times it feels like God's not listening but I want to tell you this morning he has heard your cry he loves you more than anything. And he says to you this morning, my son, my daughter, I am here for you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I have never and will never. But this morning, breakthrough breakthrough is coming to you just trust in him bless you in Jesus name Amen
God sees our hearts as we give him our worship. Like the widow in Luke 21 verses 2 and 3, she gave what she had in worship to her king. Father, we thank you for what you give us. And so enable us to be a blessing to others by giving what we are able to give. Thank you to all who continue to give sacrificially during this tough time of lockdown. Good morning, precious family of Glen Eden Church. Our reading this morning is taken from Philippians chapter 3 and verse 1. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your power in the word, Lord. Just pray that as it goes out this morning, as it is preached, that this word would come alive to many that are listening, that hearts would be ignited. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. I greet you in the name of Jesus. Mom, thank you for a beautiful reading, that lovely prayer. That's my mom, Dawn. You look so beautiful. I'm so proud of you. And I am so honored to bear the title of your favorite son in the world. <laughs> well, this morning we're looking at Philippians chapter 3 together. And we're going to spend some time there. And then we're going to be sharing an update from us as an eldership team about our response to opening up of religious gatherings. And so I'm sure you want to hear that, but that's going to be after. We're going to root ourselves in the Word of God this morning and what God wants us to hear. And so this book of Philippians has been something that we've been working through since the beginning of the year, and we have been so encouraged by it. I don't know about you, but it's been an absolute adventure and a reassurance to anchor myself in this precious letter that we have that the Apostle Paul wrote to a group of followers of Christ while he was under house arrest in Rome. They were in Philippi, which was originally a Macedonian, a Greek city of great influence. And so how it began again, let's remind ourselves. Uh, Paul arrives in the city, and on the Sabbath they go outside the city to pray. And at a riverside they find a lot of women. There's a market happening. Some are washing clothes, some are trading in purple clothing, highly expensive fabric, and they meet a woman by the name of Lydia, and she asks them, what, what are you praying about? Who are you praying to? And they begin to share the gospel with her, and the Lord moves Lydia's heart, this woman of influence in the city, and she responds to Christ, and she invites Paul back to her homestead. It must have been fairly large in order to have uh, numbers of people living on it. And while they're there, they share the gospel with everybody who can hear. And we just see a great response of people turning to Christ. Then a few days later, um, Paul's walking through the market. And well, at the marketplace amongst the tables was a young girl who, under the power of Satan, was able to get people to believe that she could tell their future. She was owned by masters very much in a way that a slave would be owned by their masters. And I'm sure her family, very poor, were earning some kind of an income from her abilities. And so Paul sees this young girl, and there's an incredible exchange of, of words that happens, but basically he sets her free by the power of Jesus. She leaves that trade forever, and her master's now infuriated uh, tell the authorities, they've obviously got some connections, and Paul ends up 
in prison. Well, in prison there's a, a, a remarkable event. The chains are broken, the prison doors are opened, and the prison guard, fearing for his life that he will be accused of letting prisoners free, is about to take his own life. And he hears a voice, and it's the voice of Paul saying, Don't do it, we're still here. And this prison guard cannot believe it, that these men haven't run away. And Paul begins to share the gospel with him. And he responds to Christ as the Lord is drawing him. And he invites Paul back to his home. And while at his home, Paul shares the gospel further. And others respond to the gospel. And they are baptized and we see this incredible act of obedience and faith that as they respond to Christ, they are saying, yes, we are followers of Jesus. And they linking themselves with Paul and those around. Now, no doubt, a great stir was caused in the city. But Paul loves this community of believers. He loves them so much that while under arrest in Rome, he writes this beautiful letter to them. That we've been reading and you've heard the text this morning that my mom read us. That we're going to look at one verse. One verse this morning. And so before we do, I want to ask you this question. During this lockdown, during this next phase we're going into from tomorrow, level three. And those of you that are able to get back to work, we're so grateful that you are. We're so glad. We've been praying for many of you during this time. For those that have lost jobs we're also praying for just incredible provision over your life and also wisdom and creativity for future employment future opportunity pray for safety but over this time it's been a remarkable thing over my own life my family and to just read that a lot of this lockdown has produced effects that we never would have expected and one of them has been the fight for happiness. The fight for happiness. What makes us happy? This world is pursuing happiness. And certainly all over the world there's been articles and advice given as to what to pursue that makes us happy. Well, an article recently did come out about what makes us happy. And there were several things. I want to share them with you really briefly. They're great. They're practical and I want to kind of lead on from that. But number one, get over seven minutes of exercise. Exercise makes you happy. Number two, sleep more if you can. That when we're sleeping well, our, our negative emotions aren't on a knife edge. And we'll actually find ourselves able to deal with certain circumstances. Number three, the article suggests spend time with family and friends. Mainly spend time with people that are positive in your life that's that's going to add to your happiness number four get outside more um, you know we've been told to stay indoors but scientists have said you know what more vitamin d over your skin will actually produce a happier mind number five help others more they suggest 100 hours a year is the magic number of helping others Serve others. Get involved in other people's lives. Number six, practice smiling. Oh, this article has been amazing. I've stood in front of the camera all the while because I had to work out some technical issues. You know, smiling is hard work. There's so many muscles involved in smiling. But what they have shown is that smiling reduces pain. It improves our mood and enables us to think better. Wow, this is going to be a great talk because I've been smiling way longer than you know uh, number seven plan a trip now i don't know about us right now we can't cross the provincial borders but that's exciting you look at a map and you go oh i wish we could go there and this is all part of our world's pursuit of happiness number eight they suggest meditate actually wire your brain for happiness uh, and get ready for those happy thoughts now, these are practical suggestions, but uh, I'm just trying to lead from this because this is the, the summarized pursuit that many of us do to pursue 
what we think will make us ultimately happy. Number nine, move closer to work. The suggestion is that if you're not spending that much time in the car, uh, bringing about those grumpy moods because of uh, drivers and traffic, well, it's going to lead to a better overall happy mind. Now, I, I know living in Johannesburg, the traffic we used to endure, I used to pray for the rapture uh, during those times of taking my kids to school because of the traffic. Uh, and then finally, they suggest just practice gratitude. Um, it, it'll increase your happiness and satisfaction. Now, these are great things. they practical suggestions. But what Paul is saying in verse 1 is, He's not saying pursue happiness. He's saying pursue joy. Pursue joy. And he actually uses this phrase, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble for me and is safe for you. Now, obviously, Paul had spoken these things to the church or written them before in a letter that we don't have anymore. But he's saying, finally, brothers, that word Adolphi in the Greek, brothers and sisters, my family in Philippi, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things. I've, I've written uh, two chapters. You've got it. I've written things, the things that I'm going to also say. I've said to you before they are of no trouble for me. That Meaning this, it's not a burden to share these things of how to be joyful in the Lord. And he, he also says this beautiful phrase, and it's safe for you. I love the, the, the fact that what Paul is saying is, friends, if you're pursuing relationship with Christ, to share that news, it's not a burden. And if you embrace it and receive the gospel, it's safe. Now, what we're going to see in the next couple of Sundays together is that righteousness comes from Christ, not from works. And so when you receive the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, there is a joy that comes and it is safe. Because to pursue your own righteousness, it's not safe. It's even suicidal to try and pursue your own holiness through your own self attempts we can't do it we'll drive ourselves crazy in that pursuit and so this little phrase we're going to look at now rejoice in the lord john piper has a wonderful quote that he wrote about in a book entitled desiring god and he wrote this many years ago but ever since I came across this quote, it has so impacted my heart that it's become something of a pursuit for me. I'm going to read it to you. He writes, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. That's what Paul is saying. Finally, family, rejoice in the Lord. Let the Lord be the source of your joy. Are oh, there some practical things that we can do that bring happiness? You know, you could view yourself in the... Um, Winnie the Pooh terms as, are you a bit of an Eeyore? Or are you a Tigger? <laughs> now the characters in the story are both precious and I love them. But the Eeyore is this grumpy, moody donkey. And there's just this rain cloud that forever hangs over him. And even the way he talks to his friends is just so sad and melancholic. Or there's Tigger, this larger than life character in the story he's forever bouncing he's forever happy you just think what are you doing and you fall into a, a potion of happiness pills when you were a little kid or or what and so are you an eeyore or, or a tigger now that's what the world wants you to, to identify so that you can go after happiness 
Now, God's made us fearfully and wonderfully. And we've got all sorts of differences. We're unique. you uniquely made. You've, you're wonderfully made by the God of the universe. And so we are wired so differently. But there's still a source that we need to come back to. It's not a source of happiness. It's the source of joy. And this theme is kind of littered in this letter of joy as we looked last week. And we're going to emphasize that again this morning together. Next week, we're going to look at what actually can steal our joy, what robs our joy. But let's track back just briefly over scripture at this theme of finding our source in joy and I want to give you three examples from the Old Testament of writers who in their circumstances rooted themselves and their hearers in this source of God. The psalmist in Psalm 32 verse 10 to 11 writes, Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous. Shout for joy, all you upright in heart. The writer is reminding us that our righteousness that comes from God, and we're going to discover that over the next few weeks. Again, Paul's reminding us in the gospel. This righteousness doesn't come from us. But when we know the position that we have, he says, Rejoice, O people of God. Then Habakkuk 3, 17 to 19. For some, a very well-known verse. Prayed by me. Quoted. We use it as a cry to God or an affirmation during times of hardship. Habakkuk rejoices in the Lord and says the following, Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, and the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Just this, this state of there's no life, there's no fruit, there's been toil, there's been labor, but nothing's coming from it in this world. Then Habakkuk rejoices, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. He makes my feet, my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. I will rejoice, says Habakkuk, in the Lord. There's no fruit. There's no evidence of labor. There's no reward of toil. But he says, in the Lord, I will have my source. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. You see that link again to the source of the joy is the work that God has done in Habakkuk's life. Isaiah 61, verses 10 and 11. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God. Something inside of the writer bursts forth, Isaiah says as he's rejoicing. For he has clothed me in the garments of salvation. He has covered me in the robe of righteousness. You see the link again? The source of what God is doing in his life, his salvation, his status, what God has put on him, righteousness. And he gives this wonderful analogy. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a groom adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, very different to Habakkuk, right? There's no sprouts. Now Isaiah is using it as an analogy. As the earth produces sprouts, and as a garden causes what is sown to sprout up, so the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. 
What a beautiful picture Isaiah is writing. And so back to Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. Rejoice in the Lord. If we were to track now what we've read in the Old Testament, and there's just verse after verse we could have added to that, where the writers are just adding this same voice to this theme of what God is doing in my life springs forth rejoicing. What status I carry now, I was once lost and broken. I was once living in darkness. I was not alive to God, but He has made me alive by the Spirit to Himself. This righteousness that He has now put on me where I was once bound in shame and guilt and lost in my own rebellion and sin. God has put righteousness on me. And the knowledge of that causes me to rejoice. And then Paul says to his precious friends in Philippi, Now, finally, rejoice in the Lord. We do a quick search in the book of Philippians. And we type in the words joy or rejoice or be glad. We're going to find the following verses. Philippians 1 verse 18. To live is Christ. He says, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that, Paul says, I rejoice. I rejoice. He's glad that Christ is being proclaimed amongst those in the city. Philippians 2, 17 to 18. Even if I'm being poured out as a drink offering. Paul saying, even if I'm going to die upon the sacrificial offering of your faith. That even if my death causes your faith to abound. I am glad, he says, and rejoice with you all. Likewise. You should also be glad and rejoice with me. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering, I am glad and rejoice. I love this, this heart of Paul. Even if my life is spent, that your faith would be made strong and alive in God. It brings me gladness and I rejoice. And then he says to them, as a result of my labor, when you see your faith Becoming strong in God, I want you to rejoice and I want you to be glad. Philippians 2, 28. I am the more eager to send him. Remember last week we discovered the work of Timothy and Epaphroditus. Now Paul's saying, I'm eager to send Epaphroditus that you may rejoice at seeing him again. Oh, imagine his homecoming. Paul saying, when he returns back to you and you gathering and he walks in those doors, you better not be sad. You better be ready for a party because I want you to rejoice when Epaphroditus returns. Philippians 4, 2-3. He's speaking to the church again about two particular ladies in the church. I entreat you, Odia, and I entreat Sintich, to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. And so Paul's saying to them, he wants these two ladies to work it out and have union together. Why? Because their names are in the book of life. They were before the foundation of the world. They were securing God. And because of that, rejoice in the Lord. And he says it again. Rejoice. Be glad that their salvation is in God and he's at work. And now because of their names are in the, the book of life, know that God's working in them. Sounds a lot like Jesus in Luke chapter 10, verse 20. He says to his friends, the disciples, Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you. They just come back from ministry and they were so pumped up. They could call demons and say, leave that woman, leave that man, set those people free. They were so pumped. 
And Jesus says, don't rejoice in that. But rejoice that your names are written in heaven. I mean, they just came back from the, the ultimate ministry week of their lives. And they are so pumped up for more. And Jesus says, don't be, don't be excited about that stuff. Rejoice that your names are in heaven, that God holds you secure, that he is not going to let you go. He's at work in you, church. Rejoice that your names are in heaven. Finally, Philippians 4 verse 10, speaking about the provision that Paul received. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, now that at length you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Remember, we discovered last week what that meant. They had the passion and the zeal, but they didn't have the opportunity to go, so they sent Epaphroditus. Paul's saying, I rejoiced in the Lord because of your financial provision to me. It speaks about two things really quickly. Number one, that Paul could rejoice in Jesus, in the Lord, because he received a financial provision from the church. Oh, when you're, when you're giving to the Lord and someone receives it, you're doing it to the Lord. But there's a beautiful posture of rejoicing. And then Paul says, I want you to know that I've received it. Now rejoice in the Lord also. And so we can take our cue from these verses that I want to just bring a summary. What would Paul be saying in chapter 3 verse 1 when he says, rejoice in the Lord always? We can say, Philippians 1 verse 5, that he could rejoice because they were partnering in the gospel. Friends, are you joyful because others around you are partnering in the gospel? Can you rejoice with us as leaders as we, as we prayerfully, humbly shepherd under Christ this church and say, let's partner in the gospel because it brings us joy. He was joyful that Christ is proclaimed. He was joyful because they had unity of love and mind. And the unity brought Paul joy, but he could say, the source of my joy was the unity, but it was Jesus that I was pointing my joy to. Paul could have joy in the fact that he could die for their faith. Paul could say, I'm rejoicing that Epaphroditus came and he, he risked his life for me, but he's back with you. I'm rejoicing. He could rejoice that their names are written in heaven, that their salvation is secure. And Paul finally could say, I'm rejoicing because of your financial contribution that you gave to me. I'm rejoicing. I want you to rejoice in that. It wasn't just giving to me. You were giving to God, and now I'm rejoicing. And so Philippians 3 verse 1, rejoice in the Lord There's so many reasons to rejoice in the Lord. And let's do that this morning. Let's rejoice in the Lord because of what he's doing in you, your family, what he's doing in your life as he's causing you to know that your faith is rock solid and secure, that he's at work in you. He's put you into a spiritual family. He's given leaders that love you and are shepherding you under Jesus. He's put around you neighbors to serve and love and be a demonstration of the gospel. He's given you means, resources to give. Rejoice in the Lord, church. Let's pray together. Thank you, God, for your love. That you'd send Christ into this world. That when we were still dead in our sin, your love motivated you to give the ultimate ransom for our lives. That your grace would be glorified. As you call us by name, as you bring us to life, as you cause us to live in this new identity as the righteous ones of, of the, the God of the universe, that we would find all these reasons to rejoice in the Lord. Be with your people today, God. Help us to pursue joy over happiness. Help us to pursue your glory over things in this world that so easily come.
and go. Bring salvation. Those that are listening that are far from you, draw them to yourself. Even now, God, let them fall on your mercy and your grace. Look up to you. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Cheeks. So friends, we want to update you, and I'm speaking on behalf of the eldership team, about our response as a church to the announcement made this last week that religious gatherings could start up. If you are on our broadcast group, you've already received the audio that we forwarded to you. And it came from our communications as elders, connect group leaders, with those that have been serving as deacons, We've involved some others in this process. I've read widely. I've spoken to church leaders around the country. And we as elders are united with joy in making this announcement to you this morning. That we are excited that our government has made the announcement that pastoring is essential and that we're able to connect shepherd, pastor. And so we're so glad for that. We're also so grateful that this day is a day of prayer that's been declared by our, our government, that we are to be prayerful throughout this day. And so we hope that over the next few hours today, you'll remember our leaders. You'll remember this nation. You'll remember your neighbors. You'll remember those in your family and be prayerful. Pray for them, friends. And so we're taking a very cautious and phased approach. As I shared, for those that have heard, we will be making our church venue available from the 1st of June for connect groups, should they wish to meet in physical space together. The connect group leader will be in contact with you and find out if you'd like to. And then the space will be available. We'll work it out on a, on a roster there will be some protocols to fulfill, but we want to be good citizens of our country and keep to those as well as faithful followers of Jesus. And so should you wish to just be in proximity with each other, hear each other's voice, be around each other, with masks on, with social distancing, you'll be able to do that as a connect group. And then over the month of June, we're going to continue to gather online Apart but, but together, or our Sundays will be streamed like this. Then into July, we would have already, over June, made a further decision as to how we will gather physically. And so, friends, we're unified. The leaders are unified. We want you to join with us. This is such a fluid situation. Many of us don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And so as we trusting that we're keeping in step with God, that you'll be praying with us. There's so many opinions. There's so many different sources of news and, and good news, fake news. Uh, there's so many ideas. There's so much emotion in this. But there are many other churches who are, are sharing the same thing with their congregations today. That the phased approach, we believe, is the right approach. We'll gather online on Sundays, still for June. Connect groups can happen online like we announced last week. You can meet physically should you wish. And then going into July, we will be making further decisions around our physical gatherings. Thank you for listening. I hope you have a wonderful day. God bless you. Bye-bye.